Hello everyone, you are joined for episode 17 of Flower Hour. Today I have on Zach Polanski. It's going to be a very interesting individual, part of the Green Party, identifies as gay and Jewish and supports many of the local social justice and nationwide and worldwide causes. I wanted to have a conversation with him about everything that's happening in the world now. So I'm looking forward to when he jumps in. Um, if anyone's got any questions, you know, again, ask questions. This is why I do this podcast. So looking forward to that. So you can join anytime you're ready, Zach. Let me just make sure he's locked in. And I hope everyone's had a good day. It's been crazy. It's been super warm. I'm looking super brown. But most importantly, I've got my tan. So I cannot be complaining at all. Perfect. Yes, Zach. Hey, so how are you doing, Zach? I'm good. Am I sideways on everyone's video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're sideways. You're going to have to come down. Come down. Cool. Okay. It's, been, it's been a long time, a long time to, make time to make it. It's been a long time. It's so good to see you. How are you doing? Yes, so that yes, I'm good. So that I'm I had good. a, I had a session, session before I did before this. Before I did so this so feeling happy and happy feeling positive. And I'm positive and I'm excited for the conversation. conversation. Cool. And boom through my... Can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Oh, yes. Perfect, oh, yes. perfect, perfect. perfect. But, but, but first of all, I've got to let you introduce yourself. yourself. So everyone that's going to be watching. So yeah, go ahead. Sure. So hey, everyone watching. Uh, my name is Zach Polanski. Uh, I do a few things. I'm a politician for the Green Party. Um, so I'm running for something called the London Assembly. Lots of people probably don't know what that is. And the Assembly has the Mayor of London. And then there's 25 people who hold the Mayor accountable. So we essentially have to make sure that he's doing the right things on health, policing, uh, fire and emergency services, and lots of other things that London is responsible for. But as well as that, I'm an actor, uh, creative. I help run a nightclub. Uh, I did lots of lots of different jobs, especially now because, as everyone knows, things are a bit crazy out there. Yeah, yeah. So and yes, this is also so my yes. first time doing an Instagram live, and I'm just like seeing things pop up, and I'm like, oh wow, I'm talking, I'm reading at the same time. I'll yeah, I feel, yeah like I feel like it's such a such good, a way, good to way to have conversations with people. When you can see, can see, can see, see what people think, think at the time as well. As well. No, no, it's amazing. I love it. So yeah, so, yeah I think my first, think my question, first question, to question to you has got to be, got how to be, do you get into the minefield that is politics? Because many people nowadays don't want to get into politics and they feel quite disconnected. Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. So I think a lot of that was, I said, I make theatre. I'm an actor. In fact, we met, I think, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Through an actor's workshop I was leading. And I think even that actor's workshop was pretty political. And yeah, so I think yeah. at that point, what we were trying to do is get young people, of which you were especially young at the time, uh, getting more involved with, you're still young, with politics and activism and, and getting them into all of that kind of stuff. And I think uh, just over time, I started to get more and more a feeling that I needed to be doing more, that actually creating art wasn't enough on its own. And actually I needed to be campaigning, be elected and be able to change things from the inside. But it's funny, I'm coming around full circle now because actually I don't think politics on its own will do it, which okay. is exactly okay. why conversations like this are so important. And actually art will change the world just as much, if not more, as politics will. And I include music in that. I include uh, visual arts, painting, cartoons, films, all of those things, because those are how you change people's minds. So um, I think you need a combination of good legislation, so good people making the laws and people that you want to represent you, but you also need good conversations out there and good interactive conversations about what those laws should be. So how do you, so how feel, do you feel with everything that's everything happening, that's in, happening politics in politics at the moment? At the moment and I would like, I would to, like find to find out, out compared to compared every to other party, party that we've that we through, and through the two horse the two race, horse race politics, you joined the, you the Green Party, I'd love to also know your decision behind that. Right. So um, I think one thing that was clear to me was I never wanted to join one of the big parties, okay. either Labour okay. or Conservative. And that's largely because we have an unfair voting system in this country called First Pass the Post. That's the same voting system that they have in America. So uh, Hillary Clinton actually won by three million more votes and beat Donald Trump. But because of the strange voting system, he ended up being president. So we've got this ridiculous uh, voting system in the States that we also have a very similar one in the UK. 
And there's very few countries in the world that has this. And this voting system means that people aren't properly represented yeah. because you only yeah. have a choice between, I'm guessing for most people watching this, but I might be wrong, anything but conservative. So you have the conservative and then you have the, the Labour candidate. So we get these Labour candidates that I just don't think are very good. They're not very good politicians. They're not very good public speakers. Not all of them. There's some brilliant ones, granted. But a lot of the time, they just don't care that much about their local community. Mm. So I just knew that Labour or Conservative was not going to be the thing that I wanted to join. Um, so actually, I joined the Liberal Democrats, first of all, uh, a long time ago, largely because they were talking about this voting system thing, and I really wanted to get that changed. Um, but then gradually over time, I got disappointed in them. There were various things. I had a big argument with them because they wanted to bomb Syria at one point um, for, for good reasons that they made out. But I just happened to think it's maybe an old fashioned view. But if a country is already at war, the UK coming in and throwing more bombs at them is not the way to. Uh, I've just got to say love you too back to Mike. <laughs> I can see him coming up on the screen. Um, but throwing more, more bombs at things is just not the, the way to, to, to do things. Um, and the Green Party at that time was speaking up for refugees. They were talking about the climate emergency. They were talking a lot about racial equality. They were talking about the voting system and all the kind of things that I care about. And then actually I thought at one point, you know, it, it's time to move and shift over. And funnily enough, I was doing a lot of debates against a lady called Sean Berry. Look at um, we had loads of debates together and a lot of the time I'd find myself thinking, oh, I kind of agree with her. So then I joined the Green Party and now she's actually leader of the party and she's running for mayor of London. So it's quite funny how we've both kind of gone on this journey together now. And I suppose, and I suppose said, that you, you went, said, full, you went circle, full circle. You, you, originally you joined the Liberal Democrats and you were debating the debate against very and now you and now the Green Party. Green party. And, right. and when you think, when about, you think about the way the politics, politics is set up, is set up right, right now, right as I said, I think it's a little bit of a minefield. At one point, in, At my one point life, in my life, can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah, oh, I can good, see. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. At one point, At in, my one point life, in my life, I was doing politics. I decided, I decided not. not to. Do you believe, do you that, believe young that young people, people now, now are more politically, more politically active, active than they ever have been? Ever have been? Um, so first of all, you've, you've told me something there that I'm not going to let go. I didn't know that you were thinking about joining politics. So I'm going to harass you about that in a, an appropriate way for the rest of your life. Um, oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm sweating because it's hot in here, but you should be sweating because I'm coming for you. <laughs> and everyone should get more involved with politics. There's a phrase that's so true that if you don't do politics, politics will do you. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And as a young black man living in London, then uh, the stakes could not be higher for your community right now for various reasons. And you're exactly what we need to. Um, uh, sorry, I was distracted by the talking again. Mike saying like, that there's a like horrible, echo, horrible echo good good advice left, advice by, left the camera. by the camera. Know what that means? Let me check. Is there still an echo? Oh, I think the echo is completely gone now. Okay, cool. Is it on me? Is the echo on me? I hope the echo on me is. Gone. I can't hear an echo. Is it on me still? Because I was waiting. Cause... Oh, it's off my mic. Is that better? Oh, they're saying it's better. Oh, thank God. All right, cool. Cool. Cool, thank God. Sorry about that, guys. A little Thanks, Mike. difficulties by me, the technologically inept. <laughs> but yeah, Zach, um, I, I yeah, so want to you need to get involved with politics. But then I didn't actually answer your question, which was very typical politician behavior. Um, young people, yes, they need to get involved with politics. I can completely understand why they want to do anything else because you think, you know, you've got other stuff to be doing with your lives. There's, uh, you know, lots of, lots of different things that they need doing. On Instagram, like, there's so many things going <laughs> on. <laughs> um, uh, but politics underlies everything that we do. And I don't think people need to become full-time politicians. That's not going to help anyone. People still need to go out and make art and make music and all of those things and, and, and do, do other jobs. But actually, we need people in political spaces who are like real people and not like the politicians that have gone before, even if it's just to go and complain in those spaces and offer new solutions. But yeah, young people have to be a huge part of that. OK, that's, and I think when I thought about politics, I said to myself, if I was to join, I would have joined Labour because I suppose I'm not really Labour and I'm not really Conservative. I would have right. rather tactically voted at the time Conservative out because um, mm -hmm. I think it would have been better under a Labour government. But ironically, morally, I agree with Green Party with more than anything else. It's just in Good my trip. head, Green Party, 
I, I, I can't see a world where they'll be voted in because I believe the things they want are too radical to a society that has been engineered in such a way, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so I think there's lots of things to unpack there. I think the first thing is I get why people vote Labour. So, you know, I'm, I'm not an idiot. I get that what the Conservatives are doing to this country. So people end up tactically voting. But even the phrase tactical voting is horrible. No one should have to vote for a party that they don't want to vote yeah. for. It breaks my heart that people go into a ballot box and with what should be a fundamental democratic right of every citizen to say, I'm from blue now, to say um, who they support, they shouldn't have to be voting for parties that they don't want to vote for. So that's the first problem. Yeah. Um, Labour have perpetuated that problem, though. So they could say, you know, OK, let's change the voting system. And then parties like the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats would then support them for one election only to get in. In fact, at the last election, lots of deals were tried to be made with Jeremy Corbyn about proportional representation and fair voting system. He refused to even have those conversations. So I think Jeremy Corbyn stood for a lot of good things and we share a lot of values. There's a lot we disagree on, too. But I think fundamentally, he did not deserve people's votes when he couldn't support a fair voting system. Um, but second to that, I hear that all the time, that I support the Green Party. You guys are brilliant. We trust you. You're authentic. All of those kind of things just don't vote for you because you can't win. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If everyone's saying that went and voted Green in the next election, then Greens would win. And you said you can't imagine a world, but you don't even need to imagine a world that's happening here on planet Earth. So just in France, uh, just in the past two months, we've got, I think it's three or four Green mayors now that are mayors of major cities. In other countries, the Green vote is rocketing up. And just in the UK alone last year, Greens doubled their number of councillors and we doubled our number of MEPs, which are the European Parliament. Of course, we sadly lost them because of Brexit, but then they came mm -hmm. out again. And then on an issue that's dear to my heart, and I know to yours too, like, so if we look at veganism, for instance, and animal rights, we need a party like the Green Party that are absolutely spearheading these things. But people claim they're radical, but it's not really that radical. It's not radical to say that every human being should have a dignified life, whether they're from, they're from the UK or any other international country. Mm. A refugee who's clinging to the side of a dinghy shouldn't be left to drown. Or if they get here, they shouldn't be put in a detention centre and treated like crap. You know, that they should be given um, a fair life and we should look at a way to integrate them into society so they can be doing jobs and paying taxes. There's nothing even radical about that. But the Conservatives have been so successful for such a long time in this country and in America and generally in the West and making these things seem like they're radical, scary ideas. But actually, even if you look at the Conservative Party of 2020 in terms of their manifesto, they're moving very slowly towards something that's more progressive. The problem is they then won a big majority and they quickly regressed and they're doing some terrible things now. Yeah. But things will change. We just need people like the Green Party and people to start believing in the Green Party and start voting for them. So then how would we get individuals such as yourself pushed out to the mainstream more? Because I was exposed to you through the acting workshop and I know the work you do. And I know through your Twitter, through your Facebook, you're loud, you're active, you're always ready to debate. But I know you personally. So how, how are we going to expose you to other people to have that same belief in the Green Party that perhaps I have, but I don't practice? It's an amazing question. So first of all, thanks for having me on tonight uh, to as much of this as possible. So anytime someone says, do you want to talk? I'm always happy to have that conversation. But we also know that you have a big following, but we need millions and millions of people to start Absolutely. to start knowing who the Green Party are. So, you know, that's that's been a thing over a long period of time. We've been chipping away at people getting to know us. But yeah, there's a bigger thing. We need people to share things. We need a wider movement. But here's the big difference between us and other parties. Um, it really isn't about me. I don't need to be shout. I am, I am loud. You're, you're right. It's one of my qualities. But actually, I don't need to be loud all the time. And actually, if I was being loud all the time, it would mean I'm not listening and I'm not representing communities. Mm -hmm. What we actually need is people, and this is something the Green Party strongly believe in, to be giving platforms to other people, to be amplifying other people's voices. So this is about people power and not one person. So one advantage we've got is if you're in the Conservatives or Labour, you need to make your leader the most famous person in the world and get them on TV all the time. And we don't believe in that as much. We believe this is much more about local communities, about serving local communities and people going, you know what, the Greens have been pretty helpful. The Greens have um, helped me out, you know, making sure that I didn't get evicted from my home or the Greens have made sure that when I got stopped and searched, they held the police accountable. So it's all those kind of things that we're constantly trying to work on. But you're right. It's, it's a long haul because we're going up against two parties that have got a lot of money and a lot of media attention. Mm. And I think very interestingly, I think if I was to draw a parallel with America, I feel like the Labour Party, for example, assume they also have the black vote. And I think you saw that in the last election of Jeremy Corbyn, where 
this marketing around grime music, which I thought was a little bit cringy. And there's the assumption that the Labour Party is always going to be good for black people. Might, that might not necessarily be the case. It could be another party. So I think sometimes we need to think outside of the paradigm shift that we're almost stuck in and plugged in through the media. Now, Zach, I know in your personal life, you identify also as a gay man and you're also Jewish. Could you tell me a little bit more about your experience? Yeah, I think, um, so to, it comes off what you were just saying, actually. I think uh, these are complicated conversations because we want to talk about the black experience as we want to talk about the Jewish experience and the gay experience, the Asian experience. But at the same time, I think politics too often then homogenizes that as yeah. if every black person has the same experience. Now, you'll know better than me, but even in the black community, whether you come from the Caribbean or whether you come from Africa, yeah. there's already very different experiences. Absolutely. Then, of course, within Africa or within the Caribbean itself, there's also then different experiences too. But even if you drill it down to the country or the town, the point is this, we are unique. Every individual is a human being. And it's not that you don't want to see skin color. So this isn't me saying, oh, I don't see color. There's no such thing as race. Of course there is. And of course there's going to be shared experiences in which people need to find solidarity and talk to each other about. Um, but it really does make me cringe when politicians start to talk about voting blocks, as in yeah. every, you're going to find the leader of the black community or the leader of the Jewish community and everyone is going to vote the same way because they tell them to. Um, it's patronizing and it's, it's also wrong. So I think, first of all, we need to look at people as individuals. Um, as a gay Jewish man, how much does that inform my politics? Yeah, it does. Um, and that's a lot of time, to be honest, because people come for you a lot when, when you do politics, as, as uh, a lot of things on social media. Um, and frequently, a lot of the times when people are coming at me, it's anti-Semitic or it's homophobic. Um, but you very quickly start to know it's not about you for the exact reasons I was saying before. It's about amplifying other people's voices. So you kind of grow a little bit of a guard or a little bit of an armor, and you just make sure that you're focusing on the issue. Um, it's a huge problem, though. I'm not saying everyone should just grow a garden armor. So say if you're a, a young woman, it's like, say, a young black woman, and you're getting misogynistic and racist abuse, I don't think it's right. <laughs> I'm saying, oh, you just need to grow armor. We clearly need to change the system. But in terms of my experience, I've grown a pretty thick skin, and you just kind of get on with it. Hey, Jaden. Someone asked, what's the topic today? So I'm speaking to Zach about being part of the Green Party, his experiences of being vegan and a gay, also a Jewish man, and looking at how we can navigate, I suppose, all the differences in our society to come towards a sort of solidarity. So, Zach, obviously I have to ask you, because it's in the mainstream media at the moment, Wiley's comments, so many yeah. regard them as anti-Semitic. Some people regard them as it's simply just true. How do you feel about that personally? And why I say you, because you don't speak for every Jewish person. I want to know how you feel as an individual. Yeah, it's a really good distinction. Um, I really like Wiley, or liked him, I should say. So uh, it, was, it was pretty gutted. But yeah, I think it was anti-Semitic. I don't think there's many ways to read those tweets and not see them as anti-Semitic. Um, a lot of the time, people confuse Israel and they confuse anti-Semitism. Mm. And to spell it out, obviously, anti-Semitism is about the Jewish people and Israel is about a country in the Middle East. Now, it's completely fine to criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic because there's lots of Israelis whether they're Jews or Arabs, who do not agree with Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the leader of their government, in the same way that I'm pretty horrified if someone met me from a foreign country and assumed that my views were represented by Theresa May or Boris Johnson. You know, they couldn't be further away from that. So I think it's important to distinguish those things. Um, Wiley in those tr uh, tweets, though, kind of exacerbated old tropes. And what I mean by tropes is just kind of common stories that are told over the, the times about Jews. And a lot of those stories are about Jews controlling everything or Jews being rich or Jews being very kind of um, within networks and, and making things happen. Now, traditionally in the past, there has been times where Jewish people in communities had been wealthier than others because there's just a strong work ethic um, often in the Jewish community, not all Jews for the same reason I was just talking about with the black community. You get different people who believe in different things. Um, but, you know, that that has been something in the past that was there. But that doesn't mean that they're controlling thing or that there's a media conspiracy. And I think um, Wiley won. I don't know if he was having a breakdown of what was going on, but it was just it was very angry and very bitter um, about Jewish people. And two, I think that's forgivable. But I think when you've calmed down and in the morning people have spoken to you, everyone, including myself, has a duty to educate themselves, mm. to listen to the community you're talking about. And I think if you ask the majority of Jewish people, they'd say, yeah, I was very, very uncomfortable with those comments. So why do you believe it has become such a pervasive and such a trope, as you said, that still continues to this day? Why do you believe that's been that way? 
Um, I think there's two things. I think one, Israel have um, exacerbated the problem. So they have a government that's out of control. They have a racist government that's um, uh, treating Palestinians awfully and I think deserve a lot of the criticism that they get. The criticism does have to be proportionate, though. Mm. So you've got countries like Saudi Arabia that have terrible human rights abuses. And I worry sometimes that people just go at Israel and they don't in the same breath talk about Saudi Arabia or what's happening in China at the moment to Muslims, which is pretty horrific and what seem to be pretty much growing concentration camps. Um, so that's one thing. And I think the second thing is that racism is as old as time. That um, sadly, groups of people get together and they scapegoat or they start to look at, at, at what, um, how they can up their advantage and um, further other people's disadvantage. Now, the difference with Jewish racism is very often with other types of racism. It feels like we're putting people down. So they say people are stupid or they're dirty or things like that. And that's obviously horrific, too. I think the difference with anti-Semitism is it's often going the other way. Okay. They're saying, oh, Jews are so clever or Jews are earning so much money, etc." But it still doesn't make it any less racist to um, talk about one person based on a group of people mm. and some old stories that aren't necessarily true anymore. And I suppose that's what some people regard to as positive discrimination. And I've faced that, I think, quite often in my life. You know, I'm six foot three or six, two and a half. If I stretch, I'll get to six, three. But there's the assumption I'm always good at sports. Yes, I'm good at some sports, but I'm not the best at everything. Do you know what I mean? So right. in some senses, for myself, for my experience, I've liked positive discrimination. But then there's also this idea that there's this label that if you don't meet, do you really qualify to be a part of that race or whatever it might be? So I suppose is that currently how do you believe some Jewish people perhaps may feel? Yeah, um, I think that's true of, of any minority that um, we can argue, stamp and shout and say that we're oppressed. And that's not to say we aren't. But I think we also need to know in the same breath that we're privileged when we're a minority, that every privilege comes, every minority comes with its own privilege. So mm. um I definitely would not choose or want to be disabled, for instance. Yeah. But then when you speak to some disabled people, they talk about the privilege of being disabled in terms of how they see life differently, how they are given a new lease of life to do new things, and also how people will treat them differently. Um, and it's the same with being Jewish and gay. Um, there's times when it feels like a disadvantage in my life. There's times when uh, if people are criticizing you and they're using it, it's horrible. Mm. But actually, you know, on balance, I, I wouldn't want to be any other way. But that comes down to our personal identity. And I think without it turning into a therapy session. That's about each of us individually loving ourselves for all the identities that we are, because there are a million things at once and we can be in love with all of those million things, even when they're conflicting and confusing and they're complicated. And of course, so we're not complete narcissists. So we have to learn to love all the million things that we see in other people too. Um, so you just said you're black, you're six foot two, happens that you're vegan, you're an activist. So I can love all of those things. And I can love the things that I don't know about you um, that might conflict with my beliefs or my views but I can still see you as a human being that I start Absolutely. to learn to go. There's so many things to, to learn from here. And I think when we can crack that with everybody and every single person we meet at every single moment, then we're doing the right thing. Um, it's very difficult to get there because we all have internal prejudices. We all have, have those little voices. Um, but I think it's about not, not having those little voices. So I never want to not have a racist or a discriminatory thought in my life. But what I absolutely want to do is hear it, note that it's discriminatory, tell it to sod off or for whatever reason, mm. and then be present in the moment. But I don't think it's about being robots and never having a thought of, oh, they're from a other community. Yeah. But actually just recognizing that. Because I think if we lost that someone's from another community other than ourselves, we've lost ourselves. Because I think there probably is something quite hardwired in us that knows that people who look, sound, behave like us are our tribe. But it doesn't mean that other people aren't too. We just need to learn and include. And I think society has done... Uh, excellent job in terms of including most people. I think society still has a long way to go. And I think, th I think it's because of the flaws of being human. It, it comes with a lot, as you said. There's people that are part of our tribe. And when someone is not part of our tribe, whether it's skin colour, different religion or different viewpoint, we tend to push people out. You know, now, you said that being oppressed also, in some aspects, you know, it can be seen as a privilege. When have you felt in your life that being gay and Jewish has been a privilege? Because not many people see it like that. I speak to some people and they say simply being black is nothing but negative or simply being gay is nothing but negative. So when, has, when did you come to that realization that in some aspects being gay and Jewish can be also seen as a privilege? And when have you been able to perform that privilege? 
Yeah, I think that's amazing. So I mentioned at the beginning that I have run a nightclub. Uh, one of the nightclubs I run is um, uh, LGBT, so for gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual people, uh, and everyone is welcome as well. Um, and it particularly focuses um, for the black community and Asian community. Um, so we've got a room of Bashman, another room of hip hop, another room of salsa, another room of house. It's the most amazing club. It's like a microcosm of everything London can be when it's yeah. its best. So it's at Scala and King's Cross. It's called Urban World. I'm promoting it, but obviously it's not happening at the moment and hasn't for a few months. But yeah. when we're back in the real world, you're, you're welcome anytime. But so you've got all the rooms, you've got everything going on. And sometimes, you know, you've got up to a thousand people um, all from their different kind of communities, all in different rooms. And you notice at the beginning of the night, very few people are mixing. So you've got people uh, from uh, uh, African heritage or all African in one room. You've got the Caribbean community in another room. You've got the um, Indian community in another room. And people are listening to their own music on the yeah. whole. And then gradually, as people have had a few drinks or they've chilled out a bit, they start to mix in other rooms. And then by the end of the night, you're just seeing everyone in everyone's rooms. And you're like, this is so much nicer. Um, anyway, my point just being is that um, I feel um, like I have a lot of affinity with the black community. And I think had I not been gay... I might not have come across the black community in the same way. I grew up in a Jewish area um, in Manchester and I probably would have hung out, hung out with Jewish friends. And when I moved to London, presumably I would have made some black friends at some point, but probably not so much. But I think when you've got that intersectionality, because I was gay, I was hanging out in gay spaces. And then when there was black people in gay spaces, I was hanging out with them. And then suddenly they would introduce me to their black friends who were straight. So suddenly you're um, crossing communities with your own privilege or your own identity. And I think it's beautiful when that happens, when we all find those intersections of, of where things happen. Um, again, I think being vegan is really interesting for this because it's so often seen as such a white middle class thing. Yeah. Um, because it so often is. And what I feel is it? like that. Bagels, avocados, salmon, and chili right. flakes. Nice. Probably not the salmon, though, right? I, I, I've, <laughs> I've heard people, but you know when they say it's a white middle class thing, aren't, I heard those are the foods they typically associate with it. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, from my experience, there is some truth in that. So when I go to vegan events, it's very rare to see a person of colour mm. um, at the event. But actually, that's changing, and that's starting to, to get better and better. But what it really needs, um, and it's not for me to tell people of colour what to do about it, but this is my observation, is that if more people of colour started going and started talking about being vegan, then more people of colour would start to be included because they would say, okay, this is a space I belong to. But that's also got to come from the white people there and making sure their space is more inclusive and they've mm. got to look at why do people not feel included in that space. How do you believe that we can make spaces more inclusive? Because when I think about the idea of safe spaces, I believe it's a home where a lot of people can come and feel safe. But just because in my head, I kind of understand the differences of people and I don't always expect everyone to mix. And maybe that's because... I'm strong in who I am as a personality and I can go anywhere and I can mesh. But how do we make those safe spaces safer for people to want to explore and to navigate who they are as people? Um, I don't exactly know how to do it, but I think it's one of the most important things that we can do. So we've got to work out how to do it. Mm. Um, I think one of the ways is always believing the best of intentions of people. So when you've got those spaces, even if people have differing views, then we've got to find a way to communicate that. I think a good example um, in politics at the moment is the trans debate. So there's um, a lot of kind of contention around uh, women uh, who have transitioned from being men going into um, women's spaces. Um, and uh, I lie strongly on uh, in the corner, if it is a corner, it's probably not a corner, of uh, the trans people that I think they're a vulnerable community and we need to stick up for their rights. But that doesn't mean we need to ignore women. It doesn't mean we need to say that, you know, your fears are unfounded and they're ridiculous, no matter how much I might feel that sometimes. But actually, you've got to find a respectful way to engage in those discussions, but without debating people's identities, because then that's making them feel threatened from the very beginning. So it's a very fine line yeah. between productive debate where everyone can talk, but also you're respecting views of the other people. Um, and we see this with religion all the time, right? About um, uh, what are British values? And I really don't like that phrase for lots of reasons because it's nonsensical. British values are built on immigration. They're built on internationalism. So they've always changed. There's yeah. never been like one fixed stone. Um, but then I do think uh, that there's sometimes aspects of people's communities that are tricky with what we want to have in this community. Yeah. So 
issues of tolerance and respect. So I think we've got to find ways to navigate that so people still feel free to be who they are, so that they can still be involved in their community in whatever way they want, but also that we can find a way to navigate that for the wider population too. Um, there's a podcast by a company called Compass they do every week called It's Bloody Complicated. And I think that phrase just sums it up for me, that Absolutely. it is complicated, but it's the most important thing that needs doing. So um, it's got to be done. I think with the advent of identity politics, it's given breath and given pay it's paved the way for new leashes of life and for people to figure out who they are as a people um now people are able to define themselves and to find themselves in the myriad of ways that the human identity can be explored and another issue i think with identity politics is it's put people at a pedestal and sometimes lower than each other simply due to the oppressions and you touched on a word called intersectionality I think it's really hard to manage identities, as you said. What's that fine line between identity, respect, tolerance? And how, like, I just wonder, how do we find it? And if there was a world that you could envision, Zach, what would that look like where we can respect all the different identities? I love that world. Um, so uh, there's a book by um, uh, the ex-chief rabbi um, called The Home That We Live In. And he said, there's different ways of imagining our community. One is, this isn't exactly what he said, but I'm paraphrasing. One is we could imagine it's like a hotel mm. where everyone is allowed into their room. And what you do in your own room is completely fine. Yeah. But you can't do that in reception. In reception, you've got to uh, book yourself in and get to your room or have a cup of tea and coffee, but nothing weirder. Otherwise, you know, you need to go to your room for that. Yeah. And he's like, sure, that's tolerant. And that's kind of a little bit of what this country is at the moment, mostly on, on a good day. But it's not it's not inclusive. He said then there's a version which is, um, I guess, like a, it's like a squat or a rave. So um, anyone can do what they want in that building. But actually, um, the building is going to get destroyed and no one's going to want to be there afterwards because it's just going to be carnage. You might have a really good night or a, really, a couple of good nights, but it's not going to feel like a home. So he said what we really need to do is look at what is a home, what would be a communal home mm. where everyone can feel safe. Everyone can have their own room, but actually they can invite people into their rooms. And actually there's communal spaces that, that can feel uh, where everyone belongs. So we've got to find ways to build that. And I said before, I think, it, again, it's about believing in the best of people. I think it's about um, setting that as an intention. Now, people might say it's really idealistic and naive that I'm you know, effectively saying, why can't everyone just get along? Because you know, that is partly what I'm saying. But it's not idealistic, it's pragmatic. Um, if you think, for instance, we have a climate emergency, the planet is on fire and might not be around all that much longer unless we as a human race and as human societies can come together and start putting aside differences and working together. So I don't think it's idealistic or naive. I think it's um, perfect. I think it's a dream at the moment, but we need to move the dream into a vision. And I think we need to do it soon because we're running out of time. I absolutely agree with you in terms of Anything that you can dream can eventually become a reality. And that leads me to speak on about climate change. And when I think of Extinction Rebellion, I think I remember I read the statistics that when they shut down central London, a gag greenhouse, was it emissions went down by at least 70%. And when you walked around in central London, the air was cleaner. There was a lot less cars. It was just beautiful to see. But then again, with Extinction Rebellion, what I noticed was there was a lack of people of color necessarily. So... I saw some of the debates and I read both sides. I saw some people calling them champagne socialists and other people were agreeing with them. I would love to know your views around Extinction Rebellion. And did you believe that what they set about has actually created a long lasting change? Yeah, so um, I was very involved with Extinction Rebellion. I was arrested with them, in fact. So I clearly believed in, in what they uh, wanted and, and still do to it to a large extent. I think a big part of that is I go on the media a lot on radio or on TV and we're always having this climate debate and we've been having it for a long time. Pre-extinction rebellion, the debate was always about does climate change exist? Yes. Um, is it real? All those kind of things. And then immediately after the extinction rebellion kind of movement, those debates have changed now and the debate was more, okay, we know climate change exists, but is it worth sitting in a road for? Is it worth disrupting someone getting mm. to work for? Is it worth all of those things for? So I think, first of all, the debate has clearly moved on um, in terms of Extinction Rebellion have firmly put on the map the idea of a climate emergency, and that can only be a good thing. 
In terms of their tactics and how they work as a movement, no, they've not cracked it at all because you're right. They're far too white. They're far too middle class. And too often when you hear them talking, their views and attitudes about things seem so distant from people's ordinary lives. So what no one's done yet and we're working on is making a link between paying the rent, worrying about how your kids are going to go to school, worrying about um, if your job is going to be okay post-coronavirus, all those kind of things, and the planetary emergency. And this is a really key thing here is we've got kind of two big areas. We've got environmental justice. So in that, I'm including things like veganism, saving the planet, um, stopping cars or reducing cars, at least promoting cycling. All of those things are in the environment. Absolutely, yeah. And Extinction Rebellion are really good on those things. But then just as important is social justice. And with that, we're talking racial equality. We're talking fighting misogyny. We're talking about safe spaces for LGBT people. We're talking making sure that the gap between men and women being paid, well, there isn't a gap, that there's equal pay. But you can't have one of these without the others. And I think too often political parties have either obsessed about environmental justice or obsessed about social justice. But actually, you can't have environmental justice without social, social justice. justice. Because the countries suffering the most in the world right now from environmental problems are places like Bangladesh and the places in the global south, the places predominantly with people of color. Yeah. So actually, you really need to intertwine these things and get people to realize that these two things are inseparable and we need to be working on both at the same time. And I think it's a very valid point because whenever I think about the rest of the world and pollution, for example, when you think about the factories where clothes are being made, if you look at where, for example, the ink is being distributed, it absolutely affects the surrounding community. They're unable to drink the water, fish are dying. These are some of the great examples that the comforts we have in the Western world come at the detriment of those in the darker parts of the world. And I use that term in terms of people of darker skin tone or whatever their skin tone might be. When we think about social justice, I think social justice in some senses has become a dirty word to some people. Some people hear social justice and go, oh, We've got another woke to this, or it's just another activist. I believe our generation has, has brought about a new, you know, selection of activists now. And people are more conscious than they ever have been before. Are you more positive about the future in terms of environmental justice aligning with issues such as social justice? Um, undoubtedly. Just look at the kids. And when I say kids, I'm literally talking about kids. So, you know, nine, ten 11 years old and younger, they are fierce. They know what they want and they're not going to put up with any crap from politicians. I think a big turning point for me was just a few years ago um, with the gun shooting in America, one of the many, but where the kids really like got on TV and held politicians to account. And those kids are now growing up to voting age. And um, some of them, I mean, Trump should really be worried. Um, but so should conservative politicians in this country because it's so obvious and it's so clear and it has been for a long time, but we didn't have social media in the same way 10, 15 years ago. So young people who were seeing these things didn't have those ways to organize. They didn't have ways to say to politicians, no, this is what we want. And we won't put up with your kind of buts, ums, ahs, or not really saying what you mean. Actually, we're going to keep holding you to account until you do what you say. Now, Boris Johnson and this conservative government have kind of gone the opposite way on it. They see what's happening on social media and they thought rather than engage, we're going to actively almost troll people and do the complete opposite. But you can feel that time is coming. You only need to look at Boris Johnson to see he is not enjoying being prime minister. Um, all him and Trump do all the time is moan and bitch about how everyone hates them. Um, they're not people who look like they're enjoying governing a country. And um, particularly Trump at the moment just looks like he's having a horrendous time. I'm not going to cry for him, but he doesn't look like uh, he's enjoying a single moment of it. Um, and that's because their time is up. And um, so, yes, I've never been more hopeful that actually change is about to come. I've, I've got a friend who often says that the start of the century won't happen until 2020s, that actually this is the real start of the century now. This is where the real new storylines begin. And actually, coronavirus will probably have been the first chapter in this new story of how we treat each other differently, of how systems are organized, how we need to look at the entire capitalist system, too, and how that's not working for people. Um, and again, they all sound like radical things, but they're not really because you can see what's happening now is utterly failing and it's not supporting us. The really radical thing would be to carry on as we are and to go, oh, yeah, it's all fine. I mean, that I say radical, it would actually be nuts. So we need to find a radical way of doing things, uh, which is to do things right. I suppose it would be radically nuts, I think, in line right, with okay. what you're saying. So also as well. Also, the word nuts is a bad use of words. I, I'm hearing myself in that. So. 
Well, don't watch. radically, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd have right. to think of, of another word. So when you think about COVID, COVID, for example, disproportionately affected um, the ethnic minority community, for example, the Filipino community and the black community because they were in more customer-facing roles and in roles where they were more likely to catch COVID and so much more. Now, also, George Floyd, unfortunately, he died at the hands of a police officer during this period. And we saw a mass change. We saw institutions almost sitting up and their ears perked and they realised we need to sort out our race issues. How have you felt with everything that's happened before COVID and also with Black Lives Matter? Yeah, so uh, COVID and Black Lives Matter, on the face of it, are two completely different things. One, we're talking about a pandemic and a virus, and one, we're talking about racial, racial inequality. But you're exactly right. These two things are, again, interlinked. They're all part of a system that is literally diseased and, and problematic. Um, I don't think we need to... What happened to George Floyd was horrific, but I don't think we even need to make that our reference point because that is going on in the UK. It's, you probably know better than I do that you know young black people and older black people are being stopped and searched by the police um, in incredible numbers um, and very often feeling like they're not respected, they're not tolerated. And all stop and search is doing is exacerbating already existing tensions between minority communities and police. So for a long time, I've had a huge problem with stop and search. Um, incidentally, it's often defended by saying, oh, we're searching for knives. Aren't you worried about knife crime? But actually, the vast majority of stop and searches is for things like cannabis yes. or low level drugs. So then the young person ends up with a criminal record, yep. which ends up meaning that they might fall into harder drugs later on Absolutely. or worse things later on. So even by its own internal logic, it's not serving the thing, not to mention the amount of white middle class drug users where we don't hear, you know, even mention about cocaine in the city, for instance. So there's a lot of hypocrisy going on and a lot of uh, illogical incoherence. So stop and search just on its own is something we need to, to deal with. Now, I don't think every police officer in London or in the UK is bad. I don't think every police officer in London or the UK um, is racist, but I do believe they're in a system that is institutionally racist. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that's something that absolutely needs to be given a huge priority because how can you have any society where if the very fundamental principle of people behaving by law and order um, can't work because we don't entrust the system to make sure that's happening. So you're already going to start breaking down in terms of coronavirus. Um, again, it's been horrible, but of course there are lessons in this time. I think, you know, in London we can hear birdsong and it's starting to go away again because you know, people are slowly starting to go back to work and the traffic's yes. starting to happen. But I think what's beautiful is for years, we've always talked and envisioned about a world that has less traffic, uh, where people look after each other, where there's a slower pace of life. And conservatives, particularly in people on the right, said, oh, no, you could never have that. It would never work. Well, now we know. We've just all lived through a period of time where actually the feeling of love and connectivity became palpable. The WhatsApp groups that were being set up in neighbourhoods, people checking on elderly neighbours or just strangers or doing nice things for them, was something that actually happened. This wasn't dreamt up by politicians. It wasn't forced into legislation. It was something we naturally did because without you know, going on the neuroscience lecture, there's a beautiful thing in evolution that yes, we've always been told this survival of the fittest story. We've always been told this evolution story. You've got to just look after yourself. But that's missing a huge key element of the story that we grew up um, with communities, with connections. And actually we've got to make sure that those connections um, are fostered, that they're nurtured, and where they're clashed, that we don't um, ignore the clash, but we find new ways of working through it so we can collaborate and get better. And I was, I really, really agree. And I've just seen a comment by Atheon, another individual, amazing guy that I've also um, interviewed at this point on my podcast. He says, quick question, our electoral system means that the left vote is split in some seats between Labour and the Greens. Surely... If you want a progressive government, we should all vote Labour. Zach, I've got to let you reply to that. Hey, Avian, thanks for, thanks for watching. I think there's a few things there. First of all, um, I said this earlier, but um, isn't it ridiculous that we even have to face this question? And you're right, we have to face this question. But everyone should be able to vote for who they want to vote for based on their values and beliefs. Um, the Conservatives are the party that are perpetuating that system. So they're the ones making you choose between Labour and Green. But that's not the whole story. 
because the Labour Party are also the party perpetuating that system. So I personally would never want to vote for a party that did not believe that I and my community should have a fair right to vote. So I don't want to reward that behaviour. If Keir Starmer, as leader of the Labour Party now, said, I will support proportional representation, then it's a different conversation. Then I'd say for one election only, sure, let's get Labour in. And that was offered to Jeremy Corbyn. If he'd taken that, without a doubt, he'd be prime minister right now and we'd be in a different set of circumstances. But second, um, I would argue if the Labour Party are a progressive party, I don't think they were particularly progressive under Jeremy Corbyn, although I think they were moving in the right direction. But I think under Keir Starmer, we've seen, like even uh, with Black Lives Matter and the statue that fell in Bristol, he refused to support it. In fact, I think he definitely erred on the side of condemning it and calling it vandalism. Um, I don't think you can have a leader of the Labour Party who claims to be progressive, who cannot see that the moment that happened in Bristol wasn't something that was really important to that community and wasn't something that didn't need to be picked up as a narrative to say, actually, this is a moment to talk about racial justice. The idea that you would retreat and make it a moment about policing and society and law and order, I think betrays where the Labour values really are, which is actually about getting power however they need to do it. So this isn't me bashing the Labour Party. There are some good MPs in the Labour Party. Clive Lewis, for instance, who ran for leader, is someone that I massively support in lots of ways. I think he's great. Um, Don Butler, I think, is doing some really, really good work too. And, you know, again, Jeremy Corbyn is controversial and there's things I didn't agree with, but on the whole, I felt his heart was in the right place. But I think with Keir Starmer, we're seeing the party make a big shift to the right. So to feed Avian's question back to him, I don't think there's ever been a time more prominent where actually there's a big space on the left, don't know where the left is on your screen, big space on the left, um, where actually the Green Party now can occupy, occupy that space. And we're planning to, to say that if people want a left-wing progressive party running London, the country, or even on international politics, and now is the time uh, more than ever before to make sure you're getting out and voting Green and getting your family to vote Green as well. So it Sorry, seems, I turned into a party political broadcast there. And, and it seems that political apathy is no longer something people really have. I think with the advent of social media and so much more, people are having opinions now more than ever. So we've also got another comment that says, problem is current Labour politicians are people predominantly from private education and a different walk of life than its initial inception. Two major parties filled with really right-wing members. And I think I find myself agreeing with that. I think... When you think about too. Tony Blair, I think Tony Blair was undoubtedly a closet conservative. I think some of the things he did, um, you know, you had a Iraq and so much more. You think about it. So I'd love to let you address that, Zach. Yeah, so I'm no fan of Tony Blair at all. And I think he was the beginnings in this country or... I guess I wasn't around before that, so I can't say that for sure. But in my mind, he was the beginning of this kind of everything we don't need in politics, which is someone pretending to be left wing or pretending to be in the centre and actually taking us towards the right. And I'd include Nick Clegg in that, too, from the, from the Liberal Democrats. That He was someone I think he spoke a really good game and I really did believe in a lot of what he said. But I think we saw when he did get into power that they veered towards the right and some of the things the coalition government did were, were horrendous. So... I think that kind of politics where you say one thing just to get in power because of this two party system, but then do the completely other thing is not defendable. And I think we, you know, we need to, to, to hold that to account. Um, the big thing I'd say on uh, people aren't apathetic, I agree entirely. And I think it's one of the few good things that Brexit caused is I just remember around that time you'd be in cafes or like walking around London or anywhere you were and you could hear people talking about politics and particularly young people in ways they never have before. Definitely. People have got to vote. Like, and vote in everything. So I'm not just talking about voting for prime minister, but I'm talking about voting for your local councillor. I'm talking about if you're in a university or school, voting for your local representatives. I'm talking about if you're in a union, voting. So we've just got to care more about the people who represent us and, and delegate us. There's an amazing thing I saw um, during COVID where there's these things called town halls. Uh, in America, where um, groups of people get together and anyone can speak and they kind of have discussions about things. And they've moved on to Zoom. And um, Barack Obama and Michelle just turned up at one, a young person's town hall, randomly, without warning them they were going to do that. And Barack Obama has always been one of the political heroes. He's not perfect in every way, but I think he's an incredible speaker. I think his heart's in the right place. Absolutely. Yeah. I think compared to what followed him, he pretty much showed uh, a pretty much perfect ideal of what a president could be within the context we live in, if we're going to accept capitalism, all that kind of stuff. And he just said that the thing that really gave him hope was um, young people learning their power. He said he's been president of the country 
And the one thing he really noticed is how other people give their power away all the time. They hear president, so they immediately go, oh, you're the president, I need to listen. But then he said, young people are learning that they don't need to listen to those titles. We can respect titles, we can respect hierarchy, but also at the same time, we can constantly challenge it and move it. And I think a huge part of that with voting and also running for office is to accept that politicians aren't other people. They're not something that's separate from us. A good politician should be us. They should be a person. They should be involved in their community. They should have the same flaws that we do. Um, and I think once we recognize that and start demanding less of them, but demanding more authenticity and connection, we'll have a better politics and a better society. And how can we demand more authenticity from politicians? And I think the current individual that made the point, he made a point that a lot of the, um, people in politics it's a conveyor belt. They come from typically the same institutions that have the same viewpoints. And perhaps they don't always share the common values of the average person, the average working class person who has to struggle from day to day. You've got rents rising. You've got gentrification happening. You've got so much happening. How do we make those individuals more authentic? And how do we get them to relate to our experience more? Uh, three things I can think of off of that. So one... Um, I really think it comes down to the voting system again. If you have a system where uh, Labour or Conservative are always going to win in certain seats, uh, you'll have seats where Labour have won for like 60, 70 years and never been challenged or the same with the Conservatives. So what the parties start to do is go, oh, you're someone who's worked hard. You went to Oxford and Cambridge. Then you worked in Parliament for this MP as a assistant running around making coffee. Then you were a researcher. And then 10 years have gone by and that person's never had a real job. They've just climbed that political ladder and then they go, we'll give you this safe seat because actually you deserve to be an MP now. Now, it's not to say that, that person can't be a good MP. It's not to say just because you've had a good education and that you're wealthy, you can't listen and represent people. But it does mean that you're excluding a whole subsection of the majority of society who haven't had those lucky opportunities. And it also means because you're excluding that part of society, that the person has been privileged enough to get to that position might not recognize their own privilege. So I think that happens time and time again. I think the second thing is much easier. I think it's when we do see politicians with authenticity, whether they're in the labor of the Greens, yeah. then they deserve our support. They deserve our vote. And that's why I'm careful to say that there are some labor politicians that I would cautiously support because when I've met them or when I've spoken to them or seen them talk, I know they're authentic. I know they're the real deal. So I go, you're not feeding me some lines here. You're not going to say one thing to get elected and then vote the other way. You're someone that even when you disagree with your party, you will do the right thing. So I think we need to reward people who are authentic. Um, and then the third thing, this is more tricky and it's something that I don't do particularly well all the time. I think we need to stop the blame game. We need to stop jumping down people's throats. I don't really jump down people's throats, but I certainly criticize when they've done something wrong. If we all cut them a little bit more slack, then maybe we'd see more authenticity and more vulnerability. I think politicians are often living in envir environments where they're so terrified to say the wrong word yeah. or to not say the exact right thing that they end up saying nothing at all or nothing that means anything. So I think if we gave people a little bit more space to be more of themselves and to sometimes make mistakes, we'd have a better, better class of politician. And um, how you do that, I don't know. Um, I know I do that in my own way by when I'm running. If I make a mistake, I own up to it. And then they ask for forgiveness with it. Obviously, you can't do that too many times before people start to go, you're making a lot of mistakes here. Maybe your judgment's not too good. But I think one or two mistakes in a career where you go, okay, actually, I got this wrong. This is my view now. This is why I hold it. Then I think people see that and I think they'll reward that. I think, that's, I think this is one of my biggest issues with cancel culture in the sense of people assume that people can't make mistakes. People can't come back better, um, come back better people. I suppose, as you said, we need to be a little bit more forgiven and understand everyone's not perfect. And as you said, if you, when you run, you might say something that not many people agree with, or you may say something that's wrong, and you will own up to it. You're transparent. And you have individuals such as Boris Johnson, where he once referred to women in that were in niqabs as letterboxes. He referred to, um, what is it, gay men as boys in tank tops, if I'm correct. But he didn't apologize for his words so i think then we're right to in some senses cancel what he says and scrutinize what he says a little bit more but why do you think we're not as forgiving as we once were in our culture um i think it's fear i think it's fear of ourselves i think it's fear of other people i think that we live in a society where we have a media again often controlled by the right wing and the conservatives they're constantly flashing horrendous narratives at us 
that um, uh, refugees are coming for your jobs, refugees are coming for your houses. And I think slowly over time, people start to hear these messages and it starts to uh, change their behavior. And I think that includes people on the left or people who would consider themselves progressive. I think sometimes we don't even realize how deeply embedded some of these awful messages are because they're so ingrained in our culture the entire time. And I think that's where we, we kind of learn as we move on and go, actually, that thing I said a few years ago is no longer appropriate. Now, there's, there's got to be lines there. There's got to be some things that have never been appropriate and no one should have ever said. And, you know, when you apologize for those, there's going to have to be a real apology there. But then I think there's some things where you go, OK, actually, on, on that small thing, I've, I've changed my now, mind now and I'm seeing a different way. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a quote I love, which is um, changing your mind is a surefire way of finding you had one in the first place. Absolutely. But do you not fear with um, te technological advancements such as social media, we've been pushed more into echo chambers now, which means we're being drip fed more and more things that align with our viewpoints and we can no longer see things from another viewpoint, even if we necessarily agree or disagree. So for example, I think you and I would agree on most things, but if we had a deeper conversation, we might disagree on some things, but because of our maturity, perhaps, and the fact that we, our minds can change, we can have those conversations. And this is why I created this podcast. And as you said, you're always up for conversation because you want people to have that. So how can we ensure people are ready and willing to have those conversations and not just hear things that align with just their viewpoint? Um, I think it's art. I think it's music. Uh, I think it's not political space. So I would love to think that I had, I was articulate enough and had the rhetoric to be able to change someone's mind. But something I'm learning more and more over time is that it's incredibly difficult to change someone's mind by just talking at them. If you can have a conversation like this, that can be different. If you can have a long one-on-one -on -one conversation with a friend, I think you can change their mind, but it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort. If you can say to them though, watch this film, go to this show, play this computer game, sometimes there will be messages within it where they can have an experience if it's engaging where actually they start to go okay i'm seeing that now i'm thinking of that in a different way so actually i just created a show um about six months ago co-created a show called eco chambers which was playing on this idea of echo chambers and this is a show that it was going to be at battersea art center but we got cancelled because of covid yeah so we moved it online but it's a game entirely on google docs where the audience members, so whoever's playing the game, have to come up with a template for the universe because the universe is being reset and they're now a demigod. And while they're wow. trying to make decisions about things, me and the other actors are starting to argue with them and making things difficult for them, making them think about planetary things and social things and the quality things. And so we wanted to find a way where people could argue, but find safe and fun ways to do it. Whether it changed people's minds, I don't know. We've not done it enough and we'd still need to give that a few more tests. But I think it's things like that where you can create I think it's about playfulness and fun. I think it's about not taking things too seriously, taking the topic and the issue very seriously because it affects whatever it is, sometimes millions or billions of people. But understanding the conversation of how you have that topic doesn't have to be super serious and it certainly doesn't have to be judgmental. Someone said, Oliver said, even COVID-19 is getting involved in cancel culture. So Zach, listen, how can we support a politician such as yourself and what would be your advice for those who, I suppose, disregard politics and see that it see it as there's no real hope? Uh, so on the first bit, if someone wanted to support me personally, uh, I've got Twitter at Zach Polanski, Z-A-C-K-P-O-L-A-N-S-K-I, and always support, um, uh, appreciate followers. I generally follow back, especially if someone's got something political in their Twitter. If they wanted to go even further, then they join the Green Party, which we always encourage people to do. I think it's in like three quid a year for, for young people. It's, you know, it's not a lot of money, but actually just having our numbers going up and the morale of knowing people are joining is, is always good. Um, also, when people criticize the Green Movement and say, you know, it's too white, it's too middle class, my answer always is we need you if you're not in those categories. I mean, we need those people too. I'm not excluding them, but we need everybody. So anyone who does not see themselves at a party meeting or does not see themselves in a brochure or leaflet that's probably because they're not there yet so actually as much as they can as long as it's a safe space for them i'd love to see them get involved and join and i'm happy to chat to anyone from any culture or any background in how we can do that and how we can facilitate that to make it easier for people and for people who don't vote um i guess um 
on my behalf, sorry, sorry that the political system has let you down because it has let everyone down, including myself. Sorry that we don't have a fair voting system. Sorry that we have politicians that say one thing and do other things. Sorry that we have a prime minister that seems so casual about the fact that people are literally dying on his watch and he wants to focus on people in dinghies and criminalize refugees rather than focus on his own mistakes and be humane. All of these things are problematic and all of these things need apologizing for but they're not going to change by not voting. They're not going to change by not engaging. They will only change by people having hope and hope will never be silent. So we have to speak up. We have to be louder. We have to amplify and we also have to listen. So I think that's turning up to meetings. I think. Sorry about that, guys. It seemed that the video just completely had cut out. I'm not really sure why. Hopefully, let me send this back through to Zach. Hopefully you'll see this and we will finish off the last part. So sorry about that. I don't know why it completely cut out. Just invited you back in, Zach. All right, here we go. Perfect. Yeah, jump back in, Zach. I'm not sure why it cut out. Perfect. Hopefully this works. My connection works well as well. Don't think there should be any issue. Just waiting for you, Zach. I hope everyone's also that has watched it previously had enjoyed what we were talking about as well. I believe it was a very much needed conversation around politics and so much more. I've put it up on my page. I'm going to finish up editing it as well. So I'm going to make sure I do that for everyone. Zach, is it is it working? Let me try this again. Sorry about the technological issues, guys and girls. See if this works again. Right, yeah, perfect. Right, it says waiting. So hopefully this works now. Okay, hey, there we go. Perfect. I, I'm not sure what happened. It just completely cut out. Too radical for Instagram. They're like, Did, shut it down. What, what are they saying? <laughs> big, um, big tech censorship. But sorry, yeah, as you were saying, you were finishing up. Uh, I can't remember what. Oh yeah, I remember what I was saying, and it was important, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, hope will never be silent. So. We need young people, particularly young people, but everyone, we need them running, we need them voting, we need people campaigning. Now, sometimes I can hear people in my head saying, it's not our job to do it. You know, we want politicians to sort it out. Well, good politicians should just be normal people who have got involved with politics. That's at the root of what a Green Party politician is. So we need people to step up, less criticism, more creation. Okay. And Zach, listen, for people that, just so basically everyone knows that they've watched the live the live just suddenly cut out so i've put it up on my page so this is currently towards the end of the live with zach but zach i want to say thank you for coming on and i suppose giving me a renewed hope in politics and i think i ha might have to come to a few meetings of the green party because i believe as i said morally and i think fundamentally i do agree with the green party and pat it's right you you want to be the change you want to see in the world and it's not up to other people. It's not up to anyone else but ourselves, you know, to go and be the change you want to see and to also enact the things that you want to see changed. And I think having a conversation with you reminds me that there are politicians who, as you said, they're authentic, they're transparent. And most importantly, they care about the interests of everyone and not just the majority, but also work to include in the minority. So I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time especially as a politician, as an individual, to just have a conversation with me. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been amazing. And also, I should say, I've really been enjoying the flower power. I watched um, Inspiring Vanessa, I think, either yesterday or the day before. Yeah, she was, she was amazing. Just 14 years old. That's, that's crazy. Um, but no, I think it's amazing that you're doing these. And if you turned up to a Green Party meeting, I'd consider this to have been a roaring success because I really mean it. Um, we need people who don't look and sound like our typical politicians that we're seeing at the moment on TV to start getting involved and say you, you're pretty much, you know, would be included in that category and you blaze the way.
That would absolutely, I, I definitely will consider coming. Send me some right. details. Send me some, um, yeah, meetings when it's happening. I'll definitely be open-minded enough to come and have a look because I can never really say never, can I? Right, absolutely. And I should say that that's not the only way to change the world. You know, I'm not, I'm not a political evangelist. It's like going to a Green Party meeting is the only thing I can ever be. And for a lot of people, actually, they'll go to a Green Party meeting and it won't be their thing. And I'm completely fine with that. Actually, you are doing your thing, which is you're doing these podcasts and you're doing these shows. But I think when it comes around to elections, people either need to run or they need to vote. And if they vote, if they don't vote because they're not happy with what's on offer, I get it. But then they need to run. Absolutely. <laughs> so they can be on offer. Absolutely. But no, thank you so much. And um, thank you. I'm really excited for what the future holds for yourself. And as I said, if there's any way that we can support you, if I can support you, I'm more than happy to do that. So I want to say thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Sean. Definitely. Zach, we'll keep in contact. Yeah, let's have a catch up soon sometime when people aren't watching and we're not on our phones. <laughs> Most definitely. I'll speak to you soon. Cool. See you later, man. See you later.